morning to all of you. Uh, today uh, we will cover this chapter on multinational enterprise. Before that, uh, what do you mean by multinational enterprise? In short form, we call this M N E. Sometimes people also call this M N C. Uh, so the difference is between enterprise and the corporation, but it means the same thing. Huh? M and E, M and C. The difference is E and C. It means the same thing, lah. Huh? Multi uh, multinational enterprise. So today we're going to cover what are the implications in terms of international trade. international trade implications as you learn in the previous class uh, international trade law gives a lot of uh, impact to individual private organizations state so the private organization is the one we refer here, M and E, eh? private organizations. And uh, we have learned that international trade law gives impact to, other than private organization, individual, And also the state, uh, the state. So I mean here refers to the private organization. Uh, so today we'll cover, uh, for example, the strategies for doing business globally. Uh, by by knowing the international trade law, we can draft a good strategy. How to do business globally? As I mentioned earlier in my class, without knowing the law, you can't strategize yourself. So you should know the law so that you can strategize your business globally. What are the challenges that you face? International property laws are very different country to country. Intellectual properties are getting important. And some countries are, do not pay any attention to the intellectual properties. So that's where um, the companies will draft their strategies to overcome these issues in each country. Eh? What are the business forms which is important for you? There are corporations without subsidiary. There are MNEs without agents. There are subsidiaries with agents. There are there are MNEs do not do any uh, do not have any uh, agents at all. There are MNE with subsidiaries, but most of the MNEs will perform their export. Huh? And what are the home state regulation of multinational enterprises? What are the host state regulation of multinational enterprises? So we're going to cover these topics today. Exporting. As we all know, all the MNEs will involve in export. Is there any MNEs do not involve in export? No, isn't it? Any? Ah, okay. Service, huh? All the MNEs will involve in export. For example, we have so many MNEs eh, or M, uh, M, MNCs in Bayalapas and they perform a lot of exports to many countries in the world. Apart from export, they also involve in franchise, which we'll go through later. Eh? Franchise, licensing.
N, etc. Eh? Et Let's look at export here. This is a very low, commit, low commitment international business activity by a MNC. Exporting does not require having a subsidiary in a foreign nation. Do you need a subsidiary in a foreign nation when you, do, when you just do export only? Huh? Subsidiary, eh? subsidiary export. Subsidiary means you have a branch in foreign country. Export, not necessary you have a branch in foreign country, eh? not necessary. But when you do export, there are a lot of issues you have to understand. For example, issues of transportation, issues of financing, issues of contracting, issues of obtaining correct export licenses, all these issues the company have to go through. Huh? An exporter will need an export manager, foreign sales agent or foreign distributor. In order for you to perform this export successfully, you may need a lot of uh, facilitators. Remember, we learned this in the first class, huh? facilitators. And you have learned this in the IB class as well, such as agents, distributors, and so on. Okay? So, you need to understand now, multinational enterprise involved in export. Apart from there, they also involve in the subsidiary, which is a branch uh, in a foreign country. As far well, you can see in uh, Bayalapas, Silicon Valley of California, in, uh, in India, what do we call? Bangalore, Silicon Valley. And apart from Bayalapas in Malaysia, we also have in um, Johor, Shah Alam, and so on. Huh? Uh, branch office can be set up by a foreign companies by registering with the appropriate state agency. Ah. So now we are going into the, slowly into the implications. Export also, there are a lot of implications because you are using a foreign agent, you are using a foreign distributor, isn't it? But when you have your branch subsidiary, you have to register. Where you have to register? In the host. Ah, and a host. That's where your implication starts to kick in. Huh? Host. When you register in a host country, that's where the implications start to kick in in terms of international trade law. A company may hire a foreign agent to act as a company representative. As I mentioned to you earlier, agent. Um, uh, for example, uh, this, uh, what do we call this? Mm, a remote PowerPoint pointer. Huh? Yeah, so you can use this to move your slides or point your uh, the slides. This company is Logitech. It's Logitech. Uh, based Logitech is from China, Logitech. This is manufactured in China, which is a MNC in China. Do they have a Logitech in Malaysia to sell this pointer? Or they use an agent to sell this in Malaysia? They use a agent. The agent is PC, de PC Depot, huh? PC Depot. Have you heard about this? PC Depot? PC Depot, huh? ah. Where did I stop? Okay, a company may hire a foreign agent, like a Logitech, huh? hire PC Depot. And there are many, many agents, for example, like Nestle. Does Nestle sell the milk by Nestle? 
No. They get a foreign distributor. If you take a Nestle um, milk packaging, look at the back, <coughs> you can see the distributor. Normally, yeah? you can see the distributor. So, a company may hire a foreign agent to act as a company representative. The agent may conduct market analysis. Engage in product promotion, serve as an import, import representative, okay? The laws, this is most important. I want you to remember this, which I put in red. Huh? The laws of the host country determine what an agent may or may not do. And this is very important. The host country law will determine what the agent should do and shouldn't do. Okay? The host country law. The host country law also will tell you whether the agent can import the product from China or not. Example, huh? the agent, huh? PC Depot, whether can sell this or cannot sell, the host country law will determine. And number two, whether the agent can import this from China, host country will determine. Is this safe to use? For example, the Logitech, Logitech product, huh? is this safe to use or not? Safe. But let's say it is harmful. For example, I'm pointing here. Let's say I point to you. Let's say I point to a, a male student. Lah. I point to him. Then it injures him. It injures him. Ah, so the host country may ban this product. So host country law implicates the MNC. Okay, implicates the MNC. That's where the international trade law comes in. Huh? Okay, company is not subject to foreign nation regulation when all the all they have is an agent. Okay, remember this, huh? Host country is the one that is important. The home country, or we can say the foreign country law, home law, does not work here. This product may be allowed in China, but in Malaysia, this may not be allowed. When I point this, it injures the uh, individual. Because the host country law will say, no, do not use this anymore, or do not import this anymore. Okay, as you all know, licensing, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, over here, franchise and licensing is another mode of activity of international business, which you already learned in the previous class. This also important in terms of the host country law. For example here, when you talk about licensing, what is important here? There has to be a legally binding contract between a country, the company, and the company in the host country, within two, uh, two companies. One can be the foreign country, another one in the home country. So the home law is very important for you to conduct this license. In addition to allowing the use of material that is protected by the patent, trademark or copyright, the licensee may also be allowed to use the other things. And you must remember all these are intellectual property laws. Okay? Intellectual property laws. And these all are intellectual property laws of the host country. How it protects the licensee and also the franchise, huh? which I wrote here. Export, yes, is controlled by the host country laws. Like the example of the Logitech pointer. In the case of franchise and licensing, where the agreement is made in the host country, whether the host country protects the intellectual property or not, through all these things, trade laws, trade secrets, technological methods and business plan and processes, all these are intellectual property of a company, whether the host country law protects or not. In Malaysia, our law is very good in terms of protecting all this. Huh? For example, this is M, you know, McDonald. Huh? Can we use the other way around? 
and open another franchise? Cannot, cannot. <laughs> Example is McDonald's, isn't it? Let me rub out this over here. This is M, right? M. Can we use the other way around? And open your own business, for example, um, wag chicken. Example, lah, isn't it? Can you can you do that? Then you put the W as the symbol. Ah, so there is a, some violation because there is some similarities over here. And Malaysia law is very, very clear in all this. But if you go to a certain country like Mexico or China, uh, you can allow to do this because they may not have uh, very good intellectual property laws to protect you. That's why a lot of investors go to country where there is a law is very strict in terms of intellectual property law, which we will cover in the chapter nine. Now we go to the business form in the civil law states. As you all know, all the organization with regards to whether it's an MNC, whether it is not an MNC, we need to register. Where we should register? In the, in the state that we are operating the business, isn't it? Let's say we go to, i give you an example. Huh? Name one MNC. Name one MNC. Nestle, yeah. When Nestle opened the organization in Malaysia, it becomes Nestle, Sundarihan, Berhad. Another one, example Intel. Intel products, Sundarihan, Berhad. Okay? So that's where it shows it must be registered in the country that they are operating. And that's where the home country, sorry, host country law implicates the company. Eh? Okay, the important part over here is the business forms in the civil law, the civil law states. Whenever a company has been formed, What is the difference between a company and the individual? Huh? Let me rub this. Huh? Over here. Huh? Whenever a company is being formed, the important part is the judicial entities. Huh? Individual. Then we have the investors, okay. Then we have, who else in the organization? Hmm? This is the organization, huh? huh? Investors. Share, uh, shareholders maybe, eh? shareholders or investors are the same. Shareholders, managers, right? Ah. Whenever this organization registered in the particular state, and the state host law will implicate the organization, Whenever come to the, whenever whenever there is a violation, whenever there is a violation of law, who will be charged over here? The individual, the investor, or the manager, or who? Who will be charged? Or the country they are operating? Huh? Let me write the country as well here. La. The country, eh? Country is over here. La. 
Whenever they have done some violation, for example, this company produces a dangerous product. When you consume, um, something happens to you, very dangerous for you. So what happens whenever the company violates something, who will be charged? The country, for example, Malaysia, or the investor, or the employee, the individual, or the manager, or the shareholder, who will be charged? Huh? Ah, we call this juridical entity. Huh? Remember, whenever a company is being formed, this is a separate entity, you know. This is an organization, it's a separate entity compared to the shareholder, compared to the manager or employee. It's a separate entity by itself. That means all these plus one, the company itself. Whenever the company violates something, we charge the company, not the individual, not the employee, not even the investor, not even the manager, because the company is a separate entity. Okay, let me show you a case on this. Huh? We call this in a separate legal entity. Important consequences of the separate legal entity of a juridical entity is liability of owners is limited to their investment. If the company, if they invested, for example, uh, RM 10 ringgit, they just lose RM 10 ringgit they will not pay more than that compared to a partnership compared to a partnership eh? you have learned this in your uh, maybe in the entrepreneurship class maybe eh? compared to partnership let's say there are 50 50 partnership eh? if the partnership company has violated something what will happen what will happen to the partnership? The partnership will break. But over here it is not. In the corporation, it is what we call a separate legal entity. If they have done something wrong, they just lose the particular investment. The company still go on. Okay, we call that separate legal entity. The liability of owners is limited to their particular investment. Huh? Owners or neither managers nor the agent nor the representative of the company. Uh, repeat, huh? Owners are neither managers nor agents or representatives of the company. They cannot act for the company or create liability for the company by their actions. Okay? So we call this this company itself as a separate legal entity. So the company will be charged as an organization, not the state, not the individual, not the manager. Okay, this is an important case, a case concerning Barcelona, Traction, Light and Power, Belgium versus Spain. Huh? Please open the textbook. Okay, it's in page 187. Huh? So this case, Barcelona Traction was, was a Canadian corporation. Remember, corporation. Registered where? Canada. Barcelona Traction was a Canadian corporation, registered in Canada, injured by the actions of Spain. So 88% of the shareholders were Belgian. Okay, this is a corporation registered in Canada and the investors 88% are from Belgium right 
So Canada choose not to bring suit in the ICJ. ICJ means what? Okay, international. ICJ means what? Ah, international Court of Justice. So Canada say, so what happened is uh, they violated something. Okay, and Spain say, okay, I'm going to charge you. And Canada choose not to bring suit in the ICJ. So Belgium brought the suit because uh, they are the major investors, so they brought the suit. So Spain objected because only BT was injured and was not a Belgian corporation. So the court found that the injured party was the company and not its owner. I repeat, eh? the court found that the injured party was the company, not its owners. Therefore, Belgium could not bring suit against Spain on behalf of the Belgian owners. So, I repeat, eh? a corporation is an entity. So, we want to charge, charge the company, not the shareholder. Remember, there is a agency law where the managers act on behalf of the shareholder in the company. Uh, so, the shareholders are not liable. If they're liable, they just lose the particular investment. RM10, RM10 will be lost. But we need to charge the company, not the investors. Okay, now we go deeper into the multinational organization. Uh, we go deeper. A multinational organization, in this case we call MNC, consists of two things. One is a branch, the other one is a subsidiary. A unit or a part of the parent, assembly plant, purchasing office, manufacturing plant, subsidiary, a company organized a separate entity that is owned by the parent. Okay, a branch means uh, it's a, a unit. It's a unit. Subsidiary means it's a organization by itself. Branch is a unit, for example, assembly is a unit. They do nothing else. Just one branch only, just do manufacturing. If it is a subsidiary, it is a company registered in the host country and they have multiple units over here. So I call this multiple units. Uh, multiple units. Okay, this one example uh, of Daimler Chrysler, where they have a Chrysler United States division of parent, and they have a Freightliner US truck manufacturing subsidiary. They have a Detroit Diesel Heavy Motor Manufacturing Subsidiary and they have Western Star Canada Truck Manufacturing Subsidiary. It's a Daimler Chrysler as a MNC, how the subsidiary been structured. And for example, um, Royal Dutch Company as a parent company, how they have holding companies and underneath they have their subsidiary and shell transport and underneath they have their subsidiaries where this all comes under one holding company we call Royal Dutch. 
and they have subsidies all over the world. So an enterprise made up of two or more parents from different states that co-own subordinate operating business in two or more states. Then we can call them as multinational enterprise. So the multinational enterprise is refers to two or more, two or more countries. One Canada. Anna. MNC, we can call them as an MNC when they have subsidiaries two or more countries, huh? two or more states in this case. Huh? Okay, the subordinate structure. A company may create the following subordinate entities to establish a foreign presence representative office. Agent or a branch. Uh, agent means what? For example, like Dell. Huh? Dell is a MNC which they operate in Bukemina. They have an agent. Who's the agent? How do you order a computer from Dell? How you buy a computer from Dell? Shop. Ah, where go shop? Huh? Dealer? Where got dealer for Dell? How do you buy a Dell computer? Dell? Huh? Where got shop? Online? Dell don't sell computer through agent. Maybe now they have opened, maybe. Maybe go one or two. But primary, their business is all through online. If I want to buy a Dell computer, I call, order through online, I pay the money through internet, and I get the computer within three working days. Who will send the computer to you? Not Dell. Dell's agent. agent huh? So agent is an independent person or company with authority to act on behalf of another. Dell, for example. Then uh, one day a computer give you problem. What happened? What will you do? Call them again, and they'll send one person to come and repair your computer in your house. You don't have to bring to the shop, whatever. Uh, so who will come and repair your computer? An agent. Huh? So this is one simple uh, structure of Dell, for example, a representative office, an agent, or a branch. Huh? Okay, uh, this advantage of a representative office, agents and branches are parent has to assume all the risk of investing abroad. Parent, in this case, um, the company headquarters, for example, if it is in US, they have to assume all the risk of investing abroad. A foreign firm is offered tax at a higher rate. Do you agree? Yeah. Foreigners have to pay more, isn't it, for this class? Yeah, always a foreigner pay more. In this case, a foreign firm is also have to pay a higher tax. Huh? Many developing states require local participation in order for foreign firm to invest or expand on its local environment. For example, uh, many foreign companies want to establish their subsidiary here. The local company will ask them to have uh, appoint the local people which foreign company doesn't like. For example, like in Malaysia, we must have 40% 40, 40 participation from local, but now it has been removed already. That's why a lot of foreigners coming to Malaysia to establish subsidiary. Last time is 40% local people must be in the um, board of director, but now it has been removed already. Now it can be 100% foreigners. Huh? So, many developing co companies, as previously in Malaysia, require local participation. But not only in Malaysia. Huh? So, that's why these are some of the disadvantages of this structure. Okay, subsidiary, as I mentioned to you, company owned by a parent or a parent holding company, as you see in the Royal Dutch, as you see in the Chrysler Daimler, 
Example, unlike a branch, it is separately incorporated. It is separately incorporated huh? as a separate entity. Joint venture, an association of person or company collaborating in a business venture. Okay, these are some of the things of joint venture. And holding company, company owned by a parent or parents to supervise and coordinate the operation of subsidiary companies. Okay, now we go to the home state regulation. Home state regulation. Huh? Let me wrap this. Huh? Okay, so far, let me recap huh, what you have learned so far. So far, before we go to here, recap what we learned so far. We learned about export. We learned about MNC. What? Ah, we learned about subsidiary. And we learned about the separation of law as a legal entity. Huh? And how the host country law impacts the MNC operation. Even if it's an export, huh? remember? Even if it's an export, in the case of a Logitech pointer just now I gave you. Then, how a subsidiary business also impacted by the local law? So now we're going to the home state regulation of a multinational enterprise. So now we're shifting eh, from host to home. So just to recap, earlier in the morning, we talked about all about host in terms of export, in terms of subsidiary, in terms of um, with regards to intellectual property, export, violations, where the host country law will be implicated. Law implicates. Now we are shifting our focus to home regulation. Eh? Home. home. Multinational enterprise are regulated within a state the same as a national enterprise. Important forms of national regulation are regulation of competition, which we'll cover later. Regulation of injuries caused by defective products. For example, this, this pointer, if I point to someone, the person got injured. We call this defective product. Toyota, right? You drive Toyota, Suddenly you go knock someone, the brake doesn't work. We call this defective product. The regulation of injuries caused by the defective products. Prohibition of shop sales practices. What is shop sale? Huh? Shop sale. Competition. Defective product. What is shop sale? Huh? Shop. Sale. Not the brand shop, you know. Shop sale. Shop sale means uh, not good practices. Not good practices. Selling something that is harmful for people intentionally. Uh, we'll look at it later. Regulation of securities, regulation of labor and employment. Can you take a child labor in Malaysia? Huh? Cannot? Uh? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Child labor cannot? cannot. Which country child labor can? India. India. Bangladesh. Bangladesh. China? Huh? Uh, so this? No, in any part of the world child labor cannot. We are talking about the enforcement. Huh? So sometimes the enforcement in certain countries are very strong. So the child labor will be prohibited. Some countries are not. So what are we talking about regulation of labor and employment? 
establishment of accounting standards and taxation. Huh? Okay, unfair competition law. In the US, the principal law of regulating anti-competitive practices is the Sherman Antitrust Act. Okay, I want to explain to you what is this competition. We'll go one by one. Huh? After this, we go to this, then we go to this, then we end our class today. Yeah. Competition. Why does competition become important in the MNC? Example, huh? this is Mm. Okay, la. Like this is example, la. This is apple because it's red color, huh? Huh? Apple, la. This is Samsung, huh? What is apple red color? Samsung blue color. Apple produce a product. Uh, let's say iPad. They sell to the market. After a month, Samsung also produce another product similar to tap, uh, sorry, similar to iPad. Uh, so this Apple can sue Samsung as a competition law says over here. Competition law says that because this Samsung produce the same product because want to compete with Apple, exactly the same. And they may, they may tell Samsung has violated the intellectual property by copying exactly what Apple has done. So they can sue Samsung. But Samsung also can sue. Can sue what? Apple. Saying that they conquer the market by cutting the price. When they cut the price, I cannot survive. Ah, it becomes the antitrust. All the antitrust act will be implicated under the competition. I repeat, eh? if Samsung produce exactly the same as Apple, Apple can sue because they want to copy exactly and they want to compete with Apple. And Samsung also can sue Apple saying that Apple is cutting the price, I cannot survive under the antitrust. So all this comes under the competition. So why this competition law for? What is the purpose of it? What's the purpose of it? Fair competition. Fair competition. Ah, to guide for the fair competition. Okay, that's the right one. Huh? Fair Competition. Fair competition. That means, uh, okay, <clears throat> Samsung can copy iPad, but make some difference. Enhancement. So you can compete, no problem. Okay, the another one is Apple can reduce price. But don't reduce so much until you kill your competitor. Do a fair competition. You want to reduce price, reduce reasonably. Don't reduce so drastically where this competi competitor cannot survive in the market. Fairness. But let me ask you, la, in this world, la, where is the fairness? Huh? No fairness, isn't it? But in the US, they have a lot of laws to, to ensure there's a fair competition. Huh? There's a fair competition. <clears throat> okay, let's go through. Huh? Section one. Forbids combination and conspiracies in restraint of interstate and international trade. Huh? All right. Uh, apply this section by using the rule of reason. Fact finder weighs all the circumstances of the case in deciding whether a restrictive practice should be prohibited. 
Please underline this word here. Restrictive practice. Reducing the price is a restrictive practice. 100% copy is a restrictive practice. Because you want to kill your competitor, you cannot do that. Okay? So we call it a rule of reason. You want to charge someone, huh? you want to charge someone, Apple versus Samsung, Samsung versus Apple, there must be a rule of reason. Is there an evidence of restrictive practice? Example, let me show you. Horizontal price fixing. A competitor at same level agree to charge same price. Huh? Certain acts are automatically illegal or for violation of section 1. For example, competitors at the same level agree to charge same price. Cannot, huh? You see here, Apple versus iPad versus Tab. Huh? What's the product that compete with iPad? Samsung's one? Tab, isn't it? Tab, yeah, it's a tab. Ah, sir, so South Korea. Okay, so can the tab and iPad same price or not? If same price, is there a fair competition? Maybe yes, what? Maybe yes. But where in the world got same price? So they say, cannot. Competitors at the same level agree to charge same price, cannot. Vertical price fixing. Seller at one level, sells to buyer at different level who agrees to not to resell below at a below a set price vertical price fixing that means a price fixing la. that means i fix a price cannot remember the price should be cannot be fixed huh? the price should be derived from where price should be derived from demand supply equilibrium Sorry, this quantity, eh? Uh, equilibrium. We cannot fix the price. Uh, should be driven by market. Horizontal market division. Agree not to sell in each other's territories. How can we say that? Hey, Samsung, don't sell in Malaysia. Eh? We cannot say that. Can we say that or not? We cannot. Hey, Apple, don't sell in Singapore. We cannot. Any product can travel any part of the world. So we cannot have all these things. Joint refusals to deal, group boycotts. So all these are, we call, restrictive practices. Please underline that word. Huh? Section two, really was section one. And it's widely used all over the world, you know, because they reuse as a US law as a referent. Okay, U.S. law is is called as a referent. As a referent. In Malaysia, we base on these laws uh, to make sure there is a fair competition. But in Malaysia, we don't have uh, much own law, so we use this as a referent. Okay, forbids monopoly in a session two. Forbid monopolies and attempt to monopolize interstate and international trade. Cannot, huh? Can you monopoly or not? Monopoly means monopoly, la. Can we do that? Cannot. We cannot monopoly a business. Can iPad monopoly iPad business or iPhone business? Can they do that? Cannot. They cannot do that, huh? So it applies to the conduct of one firm if it is a dominant firm. To show violation, you usually look for circumstantial evidence such as discriminatory pricing. That means you reduce the price so low or increase the price so high. We call this discriminatory pricing. Dumping. Selling goods for less than production costs. Why do you want to dump? So that you can become dominant. Huh? Dominant, huh? Using tying clauses, requiring purchaser of one product to buy another product. 
So this all this cannot do. This will be monopoly. In Malaysia, who is the monopoly? In every one house, there is one monopoly. What is the thing? What's the product? In every one house, there is one monopoly. What is that? Nah? Huh? In every one house, there is one monopoly. Which is not right, lah. Okay, what's that in Malaysia? What is that? In every one house, there's one monopoly. Ah, what? Yes, one product which is monopoly. Actually, got two. Electricity. Electricity, yeah, you buy from whom? Can you buy from someone else? Ah? There's nobody else to buy. There's nobody else to buy from. Another one? Water also monopoly. Actually, we got more. Water. Can you buy water from someone else? A cheaper one? Maybe not. Number three? Your telephone. Can you have another telephone or not from another company? No way. You must hire. And you don't own the telephone, are you? Pay rental, you know. How much you pay rental? Depends on the location, lah. Whether it's rural or urban, huh? So this is what we call monopoly. And they use a lot of these techniques here. Which is not good, lah. Discriminatory pricing, huh? Ah, discriminatory pricing, like urban one price, rural one price, isn't it? And we don't do this, lah. But we have all these clauses. If you use certain amount higher, they have to pay more. They got such a thing. This is monopoly, lah. This is monopoly. Okay. Clayton Act, 1914, expanded enforcement, including of uh, dealing with uh, tying clauses. Merger the results in monopolies, interlocking directories. So we cannot have all this joint venture that creates a monopoly. We cannot do that. Okay? And the other one for so forbids price discrimination. Robinson Pittman Egg, huh? Forbids price discrimination. That's what I showed just now. Rural one price, urban one price. We cannot do that. Okay, Section 12 of a Clayton Act, for a person who transact business in the forum jurisdiction, state law, arm statute, law defining the conduct of a foreign person within a state that will subject that person to jurisdiction of the state. Okay, I'll show you uh, some examples later. Subject matter jurisdiction, uh, the earlier one which I told you over here. So two tests are used to determine whether a court has subject matter jurisdiction in an American antitrust case. For example, the effect test, number one, huh? subjects foreign business to U.S. antitrust laws if activities were intended to affect U.S. commerce and the effect was more than minimal. Jurisdictional rule of reason allows the U.S. court to assume jurisdiction over a foreign business for violating antitrust law. If the alleged conduct was intended to affect the foreign commerce of the U.S., it was such a type of magnitude as it violated the Sherman Act. As a matter of international comity and fairness, court ought to assume extraterritorial jurisdiction. So what it's trying to say is, this home competition law in U.S. can be used for all the host-based subsidiaries. Okay, I repeat. Eh? This home law, antitrust, Sherman law, all these can be used for the host-based subsidiaries if they have enough evidence. Okay? They can do all these tests. If it affects the U.S. companies, we can do uh, use this law. Okay? 
example here. So this is another example of case where you want to check whether can we use a home law such as the US law applied in a host country. Please go to case in page 200. What page is that? 200. Huh, 200. Metro Industries versus Sami Corp. Metro Industries versus Sami Corp. Let me read for you the case. Metro alleged that Sami violated the market division prohibition of Sect 1 of the Sherman Act by preventing Metro from acquiring stainless steel steamers from Sami's competitors. So please go back and read the case. Court applied the rule of reason and found no substantial impact on US commerce. So now we are checking whether can we use this act for the host based subsidiary. So over here the court says what? There is no substantial impact on US commerce. So fairness on committee do not preclude plaintiff action but plaintiff fail to show the substantial anti competitive effect in the US. So when there is a not much substantial effect to the home, we cannot charge the foreign companies. So, so far we learn about host country are very important to implicate the subsidiary agent. Just now we also learn the home country antitrust session 1, session 2 also can implicate the subsidiary and the agent when there is a enough evidence substantial impact to the home ah. substantial effect to the home then they can charge the subsidiary or the agent if cannot find a substantial effect then cannot so we can have all these tests like you can do the test just now remember here effect test and all this rule of reason must fulfill the rule of reason so maybe I ask you huh? tell me how a home country can charge a subsidiary so what you should write you should write when there is a enough substantial effect to the home then they can charge For example using the effective test and also the rule of reason so this uh, if you write I know that you understand okay and don't have to be exactly word from here I want you to use your own word to describe your understanding huh? okay yeah? okay yeah? Uh, go to this uh, EU just now we look at home specific to which country US now we look at home again look at EU EU uh, also another important referent huh? because EU is a big economy eh? European Community Treaty contains two articles that regulate business competition okay article 81 forbid competitors to enter into agreement to prevent restraint or distort trade especially fixing any trading conditions example they cannot say eh? uh, you only can sell to me only you cannot sell to any other distributors uh, then there is a monopoly comes in limiting or controlling production market development or investment allocating market or supplies applying unequal terms and to parties using unrelated tying causes all these are no good for example huh?
I upon you agent, then I tell you, you sell this amount in every month. If you don't sell, you have to pay me compensation. And this is what we call tying clauses, which is unrelated to the business relationship. Because the agent cannot sell, huh? it's not agent fault. Maybe the brand is not good. Maybe the company promotion didn't work out well. So we cannot push the responsibility to the agent by giving unrelated tying clauses. Allocating market uh, supplies. Hey, agent, uh, please sell to Langkawi only. Uh? Don't sell to other part of the state in Malaysia. Uh, we cannot say that. Huh? We cannot do that. So this we call uh, allocating market or supplies. Supplies, you cannot tell, huh? hey, please only buy this supplier, other supplier don't buy. So you're creating a, unless you say that this supplier based on quality you buy, then it's different. But you cannot say, don't buy from other suppliers without any justification. So these are some of the things that they want to establish what? Fair competition. Okay. Article 82. Forbid dominant businesses from taking advantage of their position to detriment of consumers. For example, uh, directly or indirectly imposing unfair prices of trading conditions. Limiting production, market or technical development to the prejudice of consumers. Applying unequal conditions to equivalent transactions with different trading partners and imposing unrelated tying clauses. Example in uh, this case, Airbus Industries versus Patel. What page is that? 208. This is our third case. Huh? Uh, third case. UK citizen representative sued in Texas court over plane crash in India. Airbus obtained judgment from India forbidding suit anywhere but in India and then anti-suit injunction from English court forbidding proceeding in Texas. So there is an air crash, you know, Airbus in India. Okay? And a lot of uh, UK citizens also died, US citizens also died. So, um, UK citizen representative sued Texas in Texas court over the plane crash in India. So UK citizens suit this Airbus, not in India, in Texas. But Airbus say, let's do it in India, because the plane crash in India. Airbus say, la, which makes sense also, right? So English court dismiss anti so what? but the English court say, we, we should do it. Uh, sorry, English court says that, no. We, we, we should do it in the UK and uh, we cannot apply any injunctions. Injunction means uh, we stop proceeding, let's do it in Texas. We cannot stop anymore. So English court dismissed anti-suit injunction stating that India was proper forum. But English court had no right to forbid UK citizens from choosing a forum in the US. So proper remedy would be forum of non-convenient Ah, over here, okay, I mean there's no summary. So over here what does it say is, um, let's do it in India because the plane crash in India and and the UK, because UK is part of EU, huh? Huh? UK part of EU, so UK also says we cannot stop anyone to have it in Texas also. We also can do it in Texas because we don't want this uh, Airbus is from where? From UK. Ah. So they, why they want to have it in Texas? Because it's a competitor is in US. Who's a competitor in US? Boeing. Ah. So they are pushing for to have it in Texas because they may have a good judgment in uh, 
Texas. But because of this, they said uh, maybe we should. Okay, now we are going to the defective. Okay, done with competition. Going to the defective. Product liability laws attempt to discourage manufacturers from putting uh, defective products into the marketplace. <laughs> So we have laws to protect us from fair competition. We also have laws to ensure there is no defective product come to the market. Huh? For example, this law, I point to the person, the person got injured. Then you are writing a pen, suddenly the pen broke and injured your finger. All these are defective product. You're driving a car and the brake does not work, defective product. Okay, there are three theories, breach of contract, that means do not honor the contract, negligence, careless, and strict liability. Okay, let's look at it. Huh? Let's see, Japan uses only theory one and two. They don't look at number three. US uses all the three. Uh, in that, uh, European Union relies mainly on number three, strict liability. Let's look at it. What, what is this? Huh? Tort and product liability, relying only on breach of contract and negligence theories, recovery is restricted in Japan. Remedy is limited by two rules. Privity. Only the immediate purchaser can recover. This privity. Eh? Please underline in your notes, whatever. Privity. Let me wrap this. Huh? Privity. Under the privity, eh, only the immediate person that buy the product can claim for damages. Immediate privity, the immediate consumer or immediate purchaser. If I use the product, I got stomach ache, I'm the immediate one. And can I get everyone a remedy or claim? Cannot. Only the person have immediately as consume or use the product. Not everyone. We call that privity. And we cannot extend recovery for the foreseeable users. For example, you buy a noodle, la Maggie Mee, for example. And for example, she has already cooked and eat. She got stomach ache. And you also bought it, but never eat yet. Can we also claim for you? Cannot. Under privity, only the person has immediately consumed it and the rest no. Number two concept is burden of proof. The responsibility of the approving the charge of allegation. Burden of proof. So difficult to do when the defendant manufacturer remains in control of the evidence. Burden of proof is, means what? Who has the responsibility to prove that this product make me stomach ache? Who? The person who has consumed. So the burden of proof lies on who? The person who have bought it, not the company. Eh? Okay, so here are some of the common law product liability rules based on the products. What is the negligence and what is strict liability? Okay. So, for example, look at the first one, huh? the product covered. Uh, you can see this in your book, page two, two one four. Uh, they have uh, actually combined uh, this together. Uh, two one five. In page two one five, you can see this. Huh? The product cover all the products for negligence. Negligence means careless, lah. Product dangerously defective in design or manufacturing, eh? strict liability. Basic test, considering all the circumstances for reasonable care exercise. This elements, duty of care, breach of duty. Okay, so you can go back and read the differences between the negligence and the strict liability. Okay, let's go to the two 
two doctrines make it somewhat easier for a common law claimant to prevail. Res ipsa locator is a Spanish word, means the thing speaks for itself. Excuses an injured claimant who can show that product was defective when the left hands defendant from having to prove that the defendant caused the defect. Negligent per se, excuses of a claimant from showing that a defendant breached a duty of care where the defendant violated a statutory manufacturing or disclosure or requirement. The first one is, there is evidence already that uh, you have uh, stomach ache, for example, you can show the medical certificate. The thing speaks for itself. That means you already have evidence. The number, number two is, negligent means there is a violation of a breach of duty. For example, the product says that um, it is safe to use whenever you use two batteries and so on, but whenever you use it per the requirement, uh, it injures you. Maybe there is a defect, a breach of contract. Huh? We go to the third one, strict liability. Strict liability imposes liability on an actor regardless of fault. Ah, okay. That means the defendant can be held liable for acts that are unreasonably dangerous whether or not they exercise due care. So, strict liability is for the product that is very dangerous. So, we don't really bother us whether, whether there is a proof or there is no proof. When we know the product is dangerous, we can immediately charge the company. We don't have to show proof huh? the product has uh, caused some danger to someone. No, no need. Once we know the product is dangerous, we can charge the company straight away. We call this strict liability. Defendant can be held liable. That means the company can be held liable. Huh? Okay, major advantage of this theory is that it does not require a showing of negligence. No need to show that you're negligent. It's straight away we can tell it's dangerous. Uh, for example, uh, this water bottle is an uh, example. Huh? This water bottle that we buy from, for example, Japan, for example. And this is dangerous. <laughs> dangerous. For example, I drink this, I got sick. I don't have to show that evidence of it. We can certainly charge the, the company immediately because of the dangerous proposition of this. Uh, water. Unreasonably dangerous means that the product was dangerous beyond the expectation of the ordinary consumer or a less dangerous alternative was faced visible but not used. Okay, so we can charge the company immediately. Okay, these are some of the product liability rules. You can go back and look at it. Huh? The damages are, for example, personal injury or property loss. Okay, Worldwide Volkswagen versus Woodson. This is a case talks about this case. Plaintiff bought defective car in New York. That means a user bought a defective car in New York and an accident in Oklahoma. Go to page 217. So, defender retailer Seaway and wholesaler Worldwide Volkswagen sold no cars in Oklahoma and argued that they were not doing business in Oklahoma. So, court found lack of minimum contacts and dismissed the case. So, in this case, there is no evidence to say that they have a showroom in Oklahoma. So, this case was dismissed. But at all, they have uh, bought a defective car from the legal showroom, then they can charge. But in this case, there is no uh, business in Oklahoma, so they cannot charge. Huh? Okay, Asahi versus Superior Court. Plaintiff crashed on defective motorcycle. Someone bought a motorcycle, they got crashed. Asahi made tube valve system, uh, which is used in the motorbike. You should whether mere awareness that product would reach forum in stream of commerce constitute minimum context. So U.S. Supreme Court rules that possibility that the product would enter stream of commerce is insufficient basis of jurisdiction. 
So it's unjust to uh, require foreign defendant to appear as a nominee. This also that is uh, very difficult to prove. Okay, host state regulation of multinational enterprise. Host states will apply their own laws to foreign multinational. We come back to this again now. Huh? Now, just now as a whole, we come back to this to summarize what we learned just now. Host state will apply their own laws to foreign multinational operating within their territory. The host state will make three types of investigation. Whether a foreign company has consented the jurisdiction of the host state, whether a local firm is part of the common enterprise, whether the independent corporate status of the subsidiary can be ignored. Okay, this is a summary of what we learned just now. And you can go back and read uh, some of the concerns of the jurisdiction. Uh, these are some of the consequences huh, of uh, losing the, when there is a proof that there is a consequences of the host company law, sharing of profit losses, sharing of the management and the joint ownership of the business. Okay. Um, Touch Ross versus Bank of Intercontinental Limited. Please go to this page. Page 232 and 233. Eh? We issue whether Touch Ross was a multinational firm engaged in a common enterprise with an office in the Cayman Island. So, Cayman Island is over there, as you can see in the map there. Cayman Island and US is over there. A uh, separate entity for which the New York and Florida offices were not responsible. So held that bank was not deprived of an advantage of since action was uh, arose in Cayman Island, injunction preventing the Florida suit should have been reinstated. Not all states have jurisdiction over all the firm, even in the common enterprise. So in this case, uh, US is not liable for this because they have their own separate entity in the Cayman Island. So today we have learned about host and home state. Huh? Let me summarize to, to you. Huh? So today we have learned <coughs> how the host state law impact your subsidiary and how the home state law impacts your subsidiary in terms of competition, defective, and sharp sales. And how host state law normally impacts the subsidiary, not on competition, defective, and sharp sales. Normally over here is more towards um, uh, intellectual property, more towards export, more towards other violations. But when it comes to the home country, mostly the laws are effective for competition, defective and sharp sales. And please read those cases which I uh, discussed today, uh, four cases. Uh, four cases. Okay? Any question? If no question, we'll end the class here.